Hello and welcome to the Myositis Association's Myositis Research Insights webinar series. Throughout 2024, TMA will highlight several researchers and the amazing work they do. My name is Rachel Bromley and I am TMA Senior Manager of Patient Education and Support and Advocacy. Today, we have the honor of speaking with Drs. Marie Honkovist and Valerie LeClaire. Dr. Honkovist is an associate professor with more than 15 years experience in clinical research. She holds the Swedish Research Council's Clinical Researcher Grant for three plus three years and was recently awarded Marianne and Marcus Wallenberg Clinical Fellowship. She is currently supervising four PhD students as main supervisor. She's published in more than 40 original studies in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, she explores the link between cancer and autoimmunity and strives to improve the clinical outcome for patients with myositis and systemic sclerosis. Dr. Valerie LeClaire is an adult rheumatologist with dedicated myositis clinics at McGill University Medical Center's Jewish General Hospital in Montreal, Canada. She is completing her PhD student at the Clinical Epidemi Epidemiology Unit at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, under the supervision of our very own Dr. Marie Honkvist, where her research focus are autoantibodies and clinical phenotypes in idiopathic inflammatory myopathies. And both of these wonderful physicians are uh, members of our medical advisory board here at TMA. Thank you both for being here. You can go ahead and unmute. Hi. Well, we are so interested in this joint project that the two of you have been working on. Can you please tell us how you met and decided to work in this way? So we've um, actually pre prepared a few slides. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll share my screen. Because it's, uh, it's quite a, a long and complex story. Uh, those, uh, those PhD stories are, are never very straightforward. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. So I'm, I'm Valérie Leclerc. Um, and then on your screen, you also have uh, Marie Holmdisk. And then uh, we're going to present together. I'll show some slides. Marie's going to pick up in the middle of it, and then we'll we'll um we'll go from there. So I'm I'm currently finished from my PhD, so I can tell you the full story. Um, but then our ask what we were asked to present is how do I from Montreal, um, finishing my adult rheumatology ended up going to the other side of the ocean um, to do a, a, a PhD in Stockholm, so which is a bit unusual. So we're going to try to explain how we got there. So I was recruited in 2016 to work as an adult rheumatologist in Montreal at the Jewish General Hospital, which you can see here in the picture. And then we were trying to find, um, I was meant to be just doing clinic work and no research uh, at the beginning. But then we were trying to um, find an area where I could um, uh, find a niche, a clinical niche. So we decided um, to go into the myositis field. Uh, Dr. Marie Hudson, uh, which is a clini clinician researcher at the Jewish, had just um, founded the Canadian Inflammatory Myopathy Study, and she was there was a need at the within the McGill network to go get that expertise. So we were just discussing to do a clinical fellowship for me to do a clinical fellowship in that area but um we were wondering where to go so I got kind of a, a lot of liberty to propose centers and propose mentors to do that and then if we backtrack a little bit um Marie Hudson that you see here in Montreal um the year before we had that discussion went to the first global conference on myositis that many of you might know GCOM um because Ingrid Blumberg, uh, which is on the other side of the ocean, um, had uh, organized the first this first uh, international meeting in myositis. So Marie was proposed that I get in touch with uh, Professor Blumberg to try to see if she would accept to um, host me for my clinical fellowship. So I organized, and this is before Zoom was a thing. Um, me and um, and Ingrid met by Skype. Uh, Ingrid was very welcoming and she said sure you come you stay as long as you want and you're going to work with us 
So from there, I secured, I was lucky enough that I could secure some funds to do that through our um, rheumatologist association in, in my province in Quebec. And then also I got some funding from my department of medicine. And then I packed my bags. And um, in November 2016, uh, I, I was flying to Stockholm. And just for um, people to know, this is quite a quick timeline to organize a clinical fellowship to have someone answer you, uh, um, organize this with you in such a, 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 a rapid manner. So Ingrid is quite an experienced uh, <laughs> person to uh, to host people. So she really was really, really useful. And the support from the department was also invaluable to be able to do that. So I got to uh, Stockholm and then I did um, a year and a half clinical fellowship. I've chose one of my favorite pictures um, from another GCOM to show you a bit of the team that works uh, in the Mycetes group uh, in Stockholm. Um, and then I did clinical, uh, um, a bit of clinical work with them and then um, decided to, to take on a research project. So we, this is the, the project uh, that, that I've put here, published in Rheumatology, where we looked at um, efficacy and safety of rituximab in antisynthetase antibody positive and negative subject. So we use um, the clinical registry that they have uh, in Sweden called the SRQ. And then we were able to like track all of those patients that had been exposed to rituximab and try to see what happened uh, with them depending on their autoantibodies. So I worked with um, some clinicians and some researchers from the team and other PhD students. Um, so here you can see we have uh, uh, Mariam Dasmarchi, who's a, a fantastic clinician working in the Majestatis group. And then we have Ingrid just next to her. And then we have Andrelas Shunashi Garindoferia here um, that helped me a lot with that project. And I'm, I'm in the middle of this. And then we're missing Mariam. Met Marie is how we met because we worked on that project together. And what that, because at this point, I was still not planning to do a PhD, but um, it kind of brought to me this, um, this wheel, this little spark to, 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 to do research. But then there's a huge gap in between having access to the patient, having maybe a bit of resources to do research and having uh, maybe your department pushing for you to do research. You might have ideas, but there's like a large gap in between having ideas and being able to actually um, bring the, those ideas to, to life. And that I started to maybe realize that if I wanted to pursue research in even with my clinical work, then I would need to fill that gap. So when I finished my, my fellowship, um, Ingrid proposed that I would stay for a PhD. And then like a PhD is many years and I was not uh, necessarily willing to spend four or five or six uh, or more years uh, in Sweden. I wanted to start working. So um, the team was very flexible in trying to find a solution for me to be able to do uh, a PhD in clinical epidemiology while starting to work the other side of the ocean <laughs> so we came up with uh with this plan with uh, uh, marie with with both marie and with ingrid um to try to see how i could um do, do the classes and the courses in sweden spend a bit of time at the uh, karolinska to do the project and get supervision and at the same time go back and forth to montreal to um be able to work as a clinician there um, so, so I did that for a bit and then there was COVID and then, um, in a way it made things a bit, but I would not say easier because it was not easy, but, um, we became very uh, good with zoom. So we could do a lot of that by zoom, um, discuss results, discuss, um, the projects. And also I could do some of the classes actually from home during the night because of the time change. But I mean, there was some of these things that, that were maybe a bit more accessible. And also for a lot of the projects that I did were collaborations. So it kind of helped to, um, that everybody was kind of becoming very good at doing collaboration uh, on the internet. 
So maybe here I'll let uh, Marie kind of explain how our ways uh, collided. Um, I, I, I think I'll go even further back. So in two, 2010, I, I defended my PhD thesis, which was on cardiovascular comorbidity and RA. And that um, left me thinking, uh, what can I do next to kind of pursue my clinical career and, uh, and at the same time continue to develop as a, as a researcher? So in when doing my PhD work, I had learned how to use some of the administrative and, and uh, quality of care registers that we have in Sweden and that we have used so successfully in all um, parts of uh, healthcare research. Uh, but my next thought was, how do I take this with me and um, use my expertise in other fields where they haven't used registry-based uh, methods before. So if we go to the next slide. Um, so then I started working with uh, uh, Professor Lundberg, who all of you, I guess, know. And uh, she really believed in my ability to use uh, registry data to produce important um, mm -hmm. uh, knowledge and also information and data to help our patients. And together we started out with, uh, uh, with a project that was sort of like uh, exploring how we could use the registries to study a rare autoimmune disease, namely myositis. And we did that together with a first PhD student who's called Jon Svensson. And he really helped us understand how we could use the registries in a broader sense to study myositis. And the next slide. Yeah, so so he, what we did together with John was to kind of go through all the different types of administrative data sources and also the quality of care data uh, registers that we have in Sweden and see how we can explore them and link these different registry data together. And uh, while with that, um, they uh, be able to design different uh, types of studies, cohort studies and case control studies, and also follow up for, for important hard endpoints such as uh, death or cancer and other clinical outcomes. So with that in the back of my head, I met Valerie for the first time in, I think it was perhaps it was already in 2016, but in 2018, um, we started discussing how to create a fruitful collaboration and how to be able to combine, just as Valerie just said, how to combine the clinical work that she's doing in Montreal with, uh, with her also acquiring a PhD in, in Stockholm. So, so, and I think that there are two important factors that I would like to highlight when establishing this type of collaboration. And one is the fact that the PhD program at Karolinska Institute is extremely flexible. So it's, it's possible to do it part time. You can combine it with your residency or your fellowship. If you're a clinician researcher, you can combine it with having small kids and being part time on parental leave if you if you need to. And I think that's a, uh, one of the major strengths uh, of the PhD program at Karolinska. And also, as Valerie also touched upon already, I think it's extremely important to acknowledge the fact that a lot of the people at where I work are extremely welcoming to um, external researchers visiting. Uh, but I think Ingrid Lundberg is unique even in that sense. She's created a, a very welcoming environment for external researchers and also um been very careful to allow people and generous with sharing her knowledge and the group's knowledge to external uh, researchers. I think that's been two of the major important factors when creating a collaboration with a researcher from uh, the other side of the world. So 
And these are two important factors that helped us in, on this path. Um, I think quickly, uh, Valerie is gonna uh, yeah. Yes, I just wanted to step in real quick and just ask a very basic question. Um, what is uh, epidemiology specifically besides a hard word for me to pronounce? So, so it looks at different things, but it, um, it, it generates data to be able to understand the prevalence, the incidence um, of, of different outcomes, and then to be able to take those information and then um, build on it to either trying to understand what things happen the way they do, or um, to try to, to find some strategies to avoid some of those outcomes to happen or to prevent or to predict. So, um, so yeah. And Valerie, why did, why epidemiology and myositis? Well, first I was interested by the disease as a clinician, um, as it often happens. It's, myositis are, and people in the room are gonna be very well aware of this, but complex diseases, ex extremely challenging uh, for clinicians with a lot of, um, uncertainties, a lot of gray areas, a lot of unmet needs. So for our researchers, it's like a gold mine because everywhere you look, there's going to be something to work on. Um, if we look at trying to understand why people get the disease, um, who gets it, when, um, to try to predict, to try to, to, to understand risk factors, um, to then the diagnosis and the trying to, to classify the disease, trying to treat and manage the disease. At every aspect of it, there's questions. There's epi questions. Um, there's also questions for the people that are, that are working in a lab. Um, but um, but I think it's a very it's a very stimulating field. And also I think. Um, on a personal level, I think it's also, it's also a very stimulating environment to work because the, um, the, the researchers that work in the field, the different um, research groups that are working inter internationally on the, on the subject are very dynamic and they're very welcoming and they're very pushing for young researchers to um, to be part of 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 the team, so um, so I think this is very compared to maybe other fields where there's a lot of competition. I didn't feel that that was the case in my side. I I thought it was a very collaborative environment, and then so and for me it made sense to to go more for a clinical call epidemiology field also because in my institution um there's a lot of clinical epidemiologists. So as well, you need to find something that you can thrive and have a bit of support. So um, this is kind of why I chose that instead of doing maybe more a, a bench work type of PhD. Well, thank you so much. And this next question is for Dr. Honkvist. Um, and, and Dr. LeClaire uh, touched on this in her answer, but can you expound on what you can find out about myositis through epidemiology? Oh. Mm -hmm. For example, we can follow um, a larger group of patients with myositis uh, with respect to, for example, when people have their cancer, if they have cancer, we can follow people with respect to that. Uh, and, and using the, the type of data that we have in Sweden, we can also compare and contrast what happens in the myositis population to what happens in the non-myositis population. So we can actually compare. And by doing that, we can see, wait a minute, there's something going on here. Why are our patients experiencing this type of outcome? If it's another disease or a, mani a clinical manifestation of, of the myositis disease, or if it's something else. And then we can start digging into why does that happen at that time point? And is there anything that we can do to prevent that to increase the general 
well-being of our patient population, for example, as something that we can do using. Well, thank you so much. And if anyone in the audience has questions for either of our panelists, you can put them in the Q&A box and we will answer them at the end of our uh, slide presentation. So go ahead, you're on data sources. Yes. So, um, so Marie just uh, presented you maybe the administrative databases type of data sources that are um, available in, in Sweden, which are in orange. On this slide. So this is this was one of my figure in my thesis where I was showing all the different data sources that I use in my project. And you can see that those that are in like dark purple, aubergine, I don't know, um, are clinical registers, registries. So you have register from Sweden, but also I use uh, the Canadian registry. And I, I was also lucky enough to be able to use the MyNet registry, which is an international um, uh, registry on myositis. But so what I find really stimulating, and that's what I was talking about, uh, the collaboration within the field, is that you're able to use and get people in terms of really rare diseases. So you need a lot of, you need either to go to administrative database where you have a lot of people because this is kind of government uh, led where you get a lot of people in in your data source so you can capture a lot of, 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 your, of patients with myositis but also compare with the general population but then also we have those registries that are a bit we, we have a bit more details on the patient um and and then you have a lot of people that are willing to share those their data for you to be able to do projects so here i will show you um some of the projects, two of the projects that were part of my PhD, where we work more with administrative databases from, from Sweden. So we did a project on acute coronary syndrome and myositis, and also we looked at healthcare costs in, in myositis. So just to show you what we can kind of achieve using um, those, those larger data sources, uh, we took um, so Marie had access already to 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 data that um, was retrieved from the government databases in Sweden, and uh, with uh, some uh, uh, ways of identifying patients with myositis, so we could identify a cohort of six hundred fifty five patients with myositis, and then also pick up comparators from the general population. So you can see here that the myositis patients that were included in that project had a median disease duration of. 4.5 years, um, a bit more women uh, with a mean age of 60 years old. And then you have the, the, the patients, but the general population that mirrors because we kind of try to match the patients. So they resemble each other. And then um, from when they kind of enter the cohort, they're followed. And then we can pick up with time if, if patients get an acute coronary syndrome. So if they have unstable angina or they have a heart attack, um, this is this will be um, a documented in their file and then we can use hospitalization records and outpatient visits and those different um, sources to, to try to um, be able to capture those events, which are sometimes difficult to capture um, if you're doing more clinical registry in the clinic because in between visit, um, your patient can have unstable angina or can have uh, a anstemi or a heart attack and you might not, not, not be a bit aware of it. Most of the times we are, but sometimes people can be hospitalized in between visits and then you're gonna maybe miss some of the diagnosis and infection or things like that. So that's the beauty of using uh, uh, administrative databases because everything is in there. So you just need to find ways to to find the codes and try to pick up that information. But it's very rich in in, in information for researchers. So um, with this, we were able to to um, estimate um, the incidence of of acute coronary syndromes, and you can see here um, that if you look at the bottom of the of the graph, you'll see that the first line would be um, coronary uh, disease, acute coronary syndrome in the general population. And you can see that above this, which with the clear 
um, differences in between the population, you have um, the acute coronary syndrome is myositis patient, which really shows here that uh, patients with myositis are more at risk of having acute coronary syndrome. And also you, we mirror that with the mortality risk um, within the myositis population, which is much higher than in the, uh, uh, the general population. And this is important because um, um, we wanted to be sure that we were not missing some of those events because people would die before we were able to see if if they had a, a, a heart attack. So th that information is it's very useful because um, it's not just being able to manage the disease, but it's also um, for clinicians and researchers to to be sure that we're addressing other needs that uh, myositis patients have, um, and and in their cardiovascular disease is a very important. Um, area where we can improve uh, care. And then for cause of myositis, there was a, a, a few papers on the subject, but uh, we uh, worked on the first project where we were estimating costs in Sweden for myositis, and not just cost, direct cause, but also indirect cause. So we looked not only at, let's say, um, uh, uh, medication that patients receive, um, uh, x-rays that they might get, investigation, biopsies, but also um, if they were not able to go to work, if they had to be on sick leave. So those are what we call in, indirect cause of having the disease. So again, uh, using the same um, data sources, we identified myositis patient and some people from the general population to come in with. So the mean follow-up for this patient was 7.2 years, um, a bit more women, uh, again, the mean age of 60 years. And so then we picked the, the, the patients at the, the onset of their disease, and then we looked five years uh, before and five years after their diagnosis. And then for every year, we checked um, the mean and median healthcare costs. So here is it's um, figure where we where you have kind of uh, most of the information that we <laughs> of the paper that that we uh, we wrote on that uh, where you can see every five years before and five years after the kind of 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 um, trend of of cost for a patient with myositis. So here you see that in the year minus five, minus four, minus three, um, not so much different than the general population. But then we see the year before diagnosis, there's a big jump in cost. And then the year after is where people have the more uh, costs associated with their disease. And then after that, it goes down, but it never goes for the five years after diagnosis never comes back to normal because you can see here that in dark blue and a bit lighter blue you have the indirect costs which are productivity loss either disability or sick leave and those are they stay above what we would expect from someone from the general population and also they have continued uh, care either inpatient outpatient um and, and exposures to different medication. So you can see here that if we look at the mean annual cost in the year after diagnosis, it's those are in euros, um, but $21,639. Uh, so this is like a, a good, good amount of money. And then when we compare with lupus and other um, rheumatological diseases, it's quite, uh, up there in terms of the, the resources and the, from the healthcare system that are needed to investigate and treat myositis patient. So, um, so those are two of the projects that, uh, that were part of my PhD. And then there were three other projects, including the rituximab project that I presented at the very beginning. And then um, a few months ago, six months, six, seven months ago, I defended my PG in Stockholm, and then uh, I came back to work uh, full-time at McGill University. And the whole point of doing the PG is not just to hold a PhD, but it was to be able to do research. It's to be able to um, have the knowledge and the methodology to be able to, to carry on projects um, and to be able to get 
um, some funds and resources to be able to do research in myositis in Canada. Um, and, and I hope to be able to do that for many years. Um, we have a large uh, uh, number of, of physicians that are interested and in researchers that are interested in myositis uh, in Canada. And we've been working on different projects and um, hopefully with the, 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 the experience I got from my PhD, I'd be able to contribute and to, to those efforts. So that, that, that's the whole point of, of doing this. But um, I think some take home messages that I would, that I got from this whole experience is that international meetings are very important. So sometimes we might, I don't know, um, underestimate the, the, the value of, um, and then with COVID, we, I, I think we really understood the importance of meeting together with other physicians, with our students, with patients, and being able to be inspired and get the connection and the network to be able to, um, to, to do research. And then I think as a young researcher and a recent trainee, I think that financial support, funding, having the programs to be able to get, like you're doing with TMA, um, giving the the trainees a bit of support to be able to go elsewhere, to live in a, another country for a year or two. And so those are very expensive projects and they cause a bit of stress sometimes. But I think to have the support is, is, is invaluable. And then also mentors are very important. And I think within the myositis community, there's a lot of mentoring opportunities um, because it really takes a lot of people to, uh, to, to, to train and, and also be sure that someone's going to continue in the research field because there's a lot of people doing masters and PhDs and then they don't get the support they need after they finish and they're not able to pursue. And that's, uh, that's a shame, <laughs> but it's because it's very hard. And it's because you need a lot of people to help you uh, get there. And this is one of my slides from my PhD defense, trying to summarize and thank all the people that uh, helped me get my project done. And you can see this is a busy slide. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of people that are needed, especially in rare diseases like myositis. You need people from several centers to help you. You need people with different expertise to help you. You need to have funding from different um, funding bodies to, to help you get this done. Um, and you need a lot of patients that are willing to be part of the clinical registries and come off into the hospital and biobank their samples and do all of this. So we're able 10 years later to tell something and to try to help and provide some insights on the disease. So, so yeah. So Maki, I don't know if you have something to add. This was my last slide. Oh, no, I agree. There, it, takes, it definitely takes a village. And also, something that I really appreciate about the myositis research community is also what you also touched upon, Valerie, that uh, everybody is extremely prone to collaborations, mainly because they're nice people, of course, but also because it's absolutely crucial to collaborate when you're de when you're trying to answer difficult questions in rare diseases. So that's something extremely important that I really appreciate with the myositis community. I wanted to ask real quickly, we've got a question in the Q&A. When you use the term myositis, do you mean all flavors of myositis, IBM, PM, DM, or is there something specific you have in mind that you're working on? So those projects were, it's all type of myositis. Well, as much as um, we didn't go into details about how we identify patients, but it's there's a whole coding system when a physician sees a myositis patient um, because we know it's a broad spectrum of, of disease it's not one disease it's many different form of the disease um, then we need to kind of rely on the codes that people use and this is why sometimes when you, we use administrative databases um, 
it might be a bit more difficult to make the distinction between the different phenotype, the, the different sorts of myositis. Um, for some of them, like dermatomyositis, it's quite, it's 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 quite good. The codes are quite following what we see in the clinic. But when we go and maybe more um, like antisensitivity syndrome for maybe some people in the room that might have this sub subset. Um, it's really hard using codes in the databases to be able to specifically say something about that particular subtypes. So most of the times when we use a large um, population-based uh, uh, data sources, then we talk more about the spectrum of disease because there might be some overlap in between the different subsets that are there. All right. Well, thank you both for participating in today's webinar. We really appreciate the critical work you do in um, the myositis community for the myositis community. Um, did you have any parting words that you wanted to say before we uh, end this call? I was just thank you for our organizing and having us uh, share our story. Thank you so much. Um, I I for you really appreciate the opportunity to speak to the actual patients. I mean, we see them in clinics, but it's also cracked in other ways. Great. Thank you both. And thank you to the audience for tuning in to TMA's Myositis Research Insights webinar. Um, tune in tomorrow for our next webinar. It will be Ask the Dog with global myositis expert, Dr. Rohit Agarwal. That will be tomorrow between 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern. We hope to see you there. For TMA, I'm Rachel Bromley. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.